Hey there, it's Jeremy Siskin. I'm the author of this book, Playing Solo Jazz Piano, which my mom says is the book of the year, the must-have book of the season, no matter what the season. So I got some requests and comments to do a video where I watched a version of myself playing a ballad and did my best to explain kind of what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. Um, and because I'm a narcissist, I thought, great idea. Uh, I can watch myself. It's my favorite thing to do. It's actually a joke. It's kind of my least favorite thing to do. But uh, I thought I'd give it a shot and I figured out the technology. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be watching my version of Body and Soul, which is available on YouTube. You might not get through quite the whole thing. Um, and then I'm gonna be stopping and kind of doing some demos about of exactly what I'm playing and showing you how you could do something similar of your own. Um, I do know that this video has a little bit of lag compared to the sound, so I apologize. If you watch the original video on YouTube, you will see that it doesn't have that lag. So uh, I hope that doesn't distract you too much. Um, but let's get started. Let's go to the video. Okay, so very short introduction. Uh, I'll show you, I think I played this voicing. It's for a B flat seven chord with alterations. I have B flat the root, the sharp 11th, the seventh of the chord, the flat nine, the third, and the 13th. And I think what makes this maybe interesting um, is that I hear these bright sounds really prominently. So these three notes make a G major, these four notes make an E dominant, and that's all against this B flat. So, um, you know, I always try to look for these other kind of chords, whether triads or seventh chords that I find in my voicings. And then I'm doing kind of these bell tones separated by octaves. And when I say bell tones, I just mean it's a single note that I'm kind of letting ring as much as possible. And there's like a specific touch for the bell tone that you want like a very um, loud front to the sound. And so I'm using a very firm finger. And then I get off the sound and I'm using the pedal to kind of do the sustain. Now, when I do that, um, I generally like to pick some notes that haven't been in the chord, okay? So, for example, my first one that I chose was that D flat, which is not one of the six notes that I'm already playing. If you're really good with scales, you'll notice that all of these notes so far are from the octatonic scale. Um, and so that's probably the principal sound um, that I'm thinking about. I forget what else I play. Kind of is supposed to have a somewhat Debussy feel, but then I just settle at the bottom of the piano and do kind of a more normal, whatever that means, B flat dominant. So um, maybe this is obvious for a lot of you, but this tune is in E flat minor. This is the first line of the tune that you can see at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and so a B flat seven makes perfect sense. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a genius. I'm just playing the five chord uh, of the tune. So uh, that's how we're starting. Let's go back to the video. All right, so um, a lot happened there. A few things to notice. First of all, I'm not playing in time. I refer to this kind of ballad style in the book, which you can see on this side, of uh, as the stop-start rubato ballad style. So you play a little bit, and I think I did. So kind of a little suspension, I held that E flat over and then resolved it. And notice I'm using a triad at the beginning. I'm not putting in I certainly could do that if I wanted, uh, but this is an intimate song to me, and so I didn't want to kind of overwhelm it immediately with color. So instead, I'm very much in the middle of the piano, maybe just three notes, four notes, a little suspension hanging over. Okay, and then I'm always thinking soloist orchestra, soloist orchestra. So then, and again, 
against this dominant chord, I'm highlighting a specific chord within it. I'm highlighting a D major triad, I think. And it's a very bright sound, right? A couple other things you might have heard during that uh, eight measure phrase, um, there was definitely some sidestepping. If you don't know what sidestepping means, that means that you're kind of resolving into a chord by a half step. So I do so just D, D major going into D flat major. And notice again, triads, not. There's plenty of time for that later. We're just getting started, right? So the most simple triads, um, but spread out, right? So the third is on top, and it takes up a tenth overall. Okay, another side step, G7 going into G flat seven. I think that's what I did. And then, again, a little bit different than a side step. I'm playing like F sharp minor six going into D flat over F, so slightly different. Well, actually, this chord symbol here, that F minor seven, I think is a little bit inadequate because the melody note is a D flat, right? So this sound is really D flat major over F. So, I'm using kind of the minor four of that D flat, and then I'm going to D flat over up. And then find some uh, moments, I found one in there, to just let the melody alone and not have the orchestra in. And I've always thought of this little line of body, body and soul. I, I have to admit, I'm not as good of a pianist as I should be. I don't know all the lyrics. I think it's a, one of the times it's something like, why haven't you heard it, or why haven't you heard me, or why haven't you seen me? It always seems important, but kind of this, in the way that it's set musically, it's always kind of this thrown, thrown away line. It's so conversational. So I kind of like, you know, a little call and response, a little bit of soloist, and then the orchestra comes in. I do happen to remember what I did next here, um, orchestrally at least, which is that I put the melody in the tenor voice. So instead of being on top, right, which is what we usually do, I put it, so now it's right here in the left hand, and then I might go into my right hand thumb, I forget. sections and songs uh, because you need to provide some kind of a contrast and this is a way that um, you know you can have the cellos playing the melody instead of having it you know in the first violins or something like that so you create this contrast without having to do anything crazy so um, that's what's happening here that's giving it a slightly different sound so uh, let me go back to the video and uh, we'll listen to the second a section So one of the things that I really learned writing the book is that you can really take some time within this uh, stop-start rubato style. The reason that I call it stop-start rubato instead of just rubato is that rubato to me means kind of a, walk, a rocking feeling. Like sometimes you speed up a little bit, sometimes you slow down a little bit. You know, when you play a Chopin. You know, there might be just some changes in tempo. But this stop-start rubato style means that you're really taking some moments and you're expanding as though you're adding a ton of beats. Or thought of another way, you're putting a fermata there. So um, you heard me a couple times, let's see. I did something like this, I think. I think it was when I got here, I just decided, let's take a second. I forgot what I did. But you can really take a long time if you want. And then finally 
get into that last phrase. So that's really the beauty of that stop start rubato style is that you don't have to um, have any kind of metrical feeling of time. Um, you can really put a fermata after a phrase and expand. And um, again, I'm a bad example, but one really great thing to do is to know the lyrics and use that stop start rubato moment to kind of accentuate the lyrics. Um, and then you could hear that um, in terms of tempo, I'm really kind of spilling over into the bridge. Whoa, <laughs> speaking of spilling over, um, as I'm getting to the bridge, um, it's kind of this burst of energy. And again, you know, I'm thinking of musicians like Chopin and great pianists who interpret Chopin to kind of create this push and pull. Um, and the bridge kind of has this breathless feeling. Um, to me. Uh, just in the way that the phrases kind of pile up on top of one another. So let's go ahead and let's listen to that bridge and I'll see if I can think of anything to say about that. All right, so at the end, you heard these standard octatonic voices. That's the thing I've just practiced. Um, and so the voicings are something like this. It's like a tritone, a fourth, and then a tritone on top. And then I just keep going down by minor thirds. If I were a better pianist, I could do it faster. Um, a couple things uh, in the bridge, you heard me just octaves and again those are bell tones I think of that as something you know orchestral that it's flutes and glockenspiel or something and I think I did a really lame thirds lick. I really wanted to do a fancy Oscar Peterson thing but I just didn't know that I had it one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from the pianist Bill Cunliffe um, I once told him that I thought he had really great technique, and he said, I actually have very mediocre technique, but I know exactly what I can do and what I can't do. So I think I got to that moment and thought, you know, I really want to... <laughs> For those of you who have watched my video on Oscar Peterson, you'll recognize that lick, but I just don't feel like I had that in the moment, so I just came up... I came up with that, for better or for worse. Um, you heard another couple small chord substitutions in here. Um, you know, so uh, here, let me show you, let me find where I am. So here's the second half of the bridge. I'm pretty sure I did like a sharp five. Whoa, sorry, my iPad's being difficult. Yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, on this C major, I did like a sharp five resolving to a natural five. And then I think I went to an E minor seven and then just delayed that E. E diminish a little bit. And then here's just, that's where I did that crap. <laughs> um, and throughout you might have noticed that there's all these little chromatic inner lines and I'm always trying to add some kind of a inner line. I don't remember you know exactly what I did in this instant. things that I've worked on from um, trying to improvise many kind of voices at once and tracking different li lines. Um, I do talk about that in the book a bunch. By the way, that book, playing solo jazz piano. Okay. Um, and sometimes, and you heard this a little bit in one of the A sections actually, if I'm re recalling correctly, uh, sometimes it's nice to do those lines in octaves. And Hank Jones is a pianist who I love, who does that. So I'm doing it in both my right and my left. Hank Jones lick of mine is if he's playing let's say a major chord he's playing C major he'll play it in first inversion so with E on bottom and then he'll go seven resolving a six it's one of the
the oldest moves in music, but he's ornamenting that suspension. And then um, he's doing it in octaves. And I just think it's so beautiful. So, you know, if you're starting on this D major, It's another kind of beautiful trick that you can think about. All right, let's go back to the video. Cool. So you can hear at the end there, I think the most important thing to notice is that I'm setting up time for the improvisation. So if the head is in rubato, sometimes the solos can stay in rubato, but probably the most common thing is to go into time. And so this is something I work with students a lot on, is how do you set up time going into your solo? So um, I forget. <laughs> going on on the head, um, it's nice to then kind of settle into some time. Um, you know, there was a lot of harmonic activity there. There's truly nothing fancy or earth shattering going on. You know, for example, I, I noticed, I could kind of hear as we went through that it went G7 to G flat 7 to F7. So that's a double side step. I'm no, again, I'm no genius. I've noticed that with some of my students, they look at something like that and they say, okay, great, the G7 fits with the F melody, but the G flat 7, that's a clash. And you're technically correct, right? That's not the greatest sounding chord, although Thelonious Monk back there might, might like it. Um, but as long as you're passing through it, you're not going to mind that clash at all. And that's been one of the revelations for me as I've gotten better and better as a jazz pianist is I've become more and more comfortable with dissonance at each level. <laughs> um, and so, you know, obviously you have to listen and figure out where you want to resolve something. Um, but I think, you know, don't get too caught up in thinking that every little dissonance is going to ruin your performance or that the audience is going to hate it. A lot of these dissonances um, are really in service of the music. Another just small substitution I noticed that I did is I, I kind of went for a, a sort of E minor. Again, just a sidestep. Um, because of the melody note, it wasn't just an E minor 7, because that would have been too much clash even for me. <laughs> so I think I did something like an E minor 6, so that would be with the C sharp replacing the D, and then maybe like to an E7 on the F. Something like that. See if we can do a little bit of the solo. I don't want this video to be 45 minutes long. Nobody's gonna stay for that. But let's listen to a little bit of the solo. I'm sorry for that little interruption. I was just turning off my headphones because they were annoying. Um, what I hear more than anything in that solo is myself trying to space out the licks, <laughs> the improvisations, the melodies. I shouldn't say the licks. Um, but I'm hearing all these kind of methods. You know, so first I started very close to the melody. I don't remember what I played, but it was something like that. Um, but then, and I've gotten better as, at this as I've gotten older. 
kind of comping for myself. Creating a little bit of syncopation in the left hand. I don't know if you noticed. Right, and creating these little inner melodies that you would have if you were writing an orchestra piece um, that we that help, again, space out the melody, provide a little bit of interest in between melodic phrases. I learned that from Keith Jarrett. Um, I played one of his transcriptions and noticed that he had kind of melodies and then counter melodies and then accompaniments going on. It wasn't just all accompaniment melody, it was sometimes. different uh, singers, there's different people in the conversation. It's not just one uh, person. It's not one soloist and then a compliment. There's all these different layers going on. And I've gotten better at that as I've gotten older. Let's go back to the video, see if there's anything interesting. So there's the bridge. So you heard some uh, some stupid double time. Uh, I mean stupid because the content was just not necessarily great. Um, but uh, you know, one thing that I could hear myself trying to do is to put some bright shapes in. And one thing that I try to do sometimes, um, and this is after Keith is someone who does this, Brad Meldow is somebody who does this amazingly well, is to put in some major triads. Like um, I heard myself do a C sharp E, and then especially a one two three five or a one three four five. Um, and this isn't necessarily going with the chord, I'm just putting in, I don't know, I think this was like over the F7, which, you know, again, <laughs> nice and comfortable dissonance. Um, those are these little pockets of kind of color and light and brightness within there, which hopefully make the playing interesting and memorable. Um, a couple other things I noticed in that second A section, first is I'm varying the articulation. And this is something definitely I've stolen from Fred Hirsch, who's the greatest in the world at this, is that when he's playing a ballad, it's not just this kind of intense legato, but sometimes it could be a playful. There could be a playfulness to it. There can be some staccato. There can be some two-note slurs in there. Um, also, you know, if you're watching and listening to my left hand, you'll notice there are sometimes I'm playing the bass notes, but there are also lots of times when I'm just leaving the bass out. This is how Bill Evans plays solo piano so much of the time. So I'm comping for myself basically the way that I would comp for myself in a trio. And then last point about this A section um, is that oftentimes if I'm doing something interesting or colorful harmonically, that's a good time to put in the left hand to kind of emphasize something. And Brad Meldow is the guy who I totally um, look to for this. So there's kind of this shape to it, which matches the harmonic tension, which also matches the left hand. So there's kind of these three things working together. You know, I can go up the piano, I'm doing the same thing I did in the introduction here, over a B flat seven, I'm doing a G major chord. But that left hand is also kind of hitting some kind of a syncopation to add to the color of it. So your left hand and right hand can work together in so many interesting ways, um, especially on ballads. All right, let's check out the bridge.
to talk about there, right? Um, so obviously I'm using this kind of 16th note. Not something I do a lot, but uh, for some reason the moment inspired me. Um, and did some weird reharmonizing there. I got myself into some trouble. <laughs> it was like on an E7 when I needed to resolve to C or something like that. Um, it wasn't the cleanest, most beautiful harmonic presentation, but I made it. <laughs> you know, I'd rather get myself into some trouble and get out of it than never get into trouble at all. How boring would that be? Um, and then in the second half of that, you heard two different pianistic textures, which I practiced a lot. The first is perpetual motion. <laughs> So I'm basically going right, right, left, right, right, left, right. I practice that. I know how to do it. <laughs> um, and it's kind of fun because you could do it short. But here I'm doing it long. to then kind of blocked out homophonic. I'm not sure what what I actually did, but it was all these blocked chords with maybe two or three notes in the left hand, three or four notes in the right hand, where the two hands are playing together. All right, let's see if we can finish up this A section and we'll call it a day on this video. And I'll ask you guys, if you like this, I'm happy to finish with the rest of this track or to try it on some other tracks um, and let you know exactly what I'm thinking. here. Um, the first is that I'm kind of proud about the way that I got from more of a ballad feel to more of a double time feel. It wasn't just immediately like, okay, and now I'm going into double time. It was a kind of this process that grew throughout that first chorus, but now I'm kind of in more of a double time swingy feel. Um, you know, the other thing is that you heard I was doing a pedal point, and this isn't really a great tune for a pedal point, because it starts in kind of E flat minor and it ends in D flat major, so... one note in the bass while the chords move above are such a great way to create contrast within a piece. Um, and I actually was using a pedal point in that bridge as well. I don't know if you heard that I had an A at the bottom during the bridge. So um, definitely can use some pedal points. Um, that's a great musical tool, again, to create some contrast. Okay, so again, if you enjoyed this, let me know in the comments and I'm happy to do more of it. Like I said, I'm a narcissist, so I'll talk about myself all day. Um, and then, um, Really appreciate orders of my book. It's really awesome when you buy it from my website because then I don't end up giving half of my money to Amazon and Jeff Bezos. Uh, thanks for your likes and subscribes, and see you soon.